In this video, I'm going to walk you through some advanced tips and tricks for slicing models in Fusion 360 for your 3D printing projects. And this is an advanced-ish tutorial on my techniques. So if you're new to Fusion 360, I highly recommend checking out my CAD for Newbie series first. But without further ado, let's get started. So why might you want to slice your models in Fusion 360 once you've designed them? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one is your print volume might be too small. You might have a design that's quite large and you need to slice it up to fit your smaller printing volume. Number two is printability. Now, specifically talking about FDM 3D printers, but this also applies to resin based machines too. There's only so far you can push overhangs till they're too much and the print will fail. So for some designs, like for example, this one, you might need to incorporate certain cuts and break your model up to avoid using support materials. And number three is aesthetics. So for example, you might want to slice your model up so you don't have to use support material because it leaves a scar on surfaces it touches. And also underside curves always look worse than top side curves when it comes to these 3D printing processes. So you might want to slice your print for that purpose too. Another reason is assembly. You might be designing an assembly that snaps together or goes together. You put in, you put components in and then you put it together afterwards. That's a great reason why you might need to slice a shell up, for example, so you can print it and then assemble your project later. And then finally, color. You might just want to incorporate different colors into your model. And unless you have a dual color 3D printer, that's kind of difficult to do if you're printing it all in one go. So often what I'll do if I want accents and colors is I'll just print parts separately and assemble afterwards. So I've broken down my techniques into two categories. I call them the slide category and the rotating category in terms of how I break models up and I design them to be reassembled afterwards. But let's start with the simplest in the slide category, which is a plain cut. I've talked about plain cuts before when slicing STL files, but because we're in the CAD environment, we have a lot more control over that cut when we're actually working with the model directly. So this is a Steinmetz solid. It's a two-sided Steinmetz solid. This is created using two cylinders that intersect each other. I've shown these before on the channel. And for this model, look, you would struggle to print it without needing supports. There's no real easy, there's no place to put it. So what I decided with this model is to slice it using a plane cut. So here I've got a plane and that's just a construction plane within Fusion 360. Now the cut tool is up here, split body. Now it's, I call it plain cut because I come from mesh mixer, but in Fusion it's called split body. And to use this tool, you need a body, obviously a body to split and you need a splitting tool. And that comes in the form of a surface. Now here I'm using a plane because a plane is a 2D surface, but we can use surfaces in Fusion 360 with the split body tool to get a lot more control over that cut. But the simplest by far is dumping a plane in where you want it and doing split body to get two pieces. Now we have these two parts like this. But you might be asking yourself, uh, Angus, that's great, but I mean, how do you align them? You just mash them together and what glue them? Well, basically, yeah, if you left it like this, but obviously there's better ways to do it. And the better way to do it is to incorporate indexing features, which means when you put two parts together, they lock together in some form. That means they align and you don't have to worry too much about getting things precise using just glue or something, or in an ideal world, no additional adhesives or fasteners at all. And to create that indexing feature, what I've designed in this model is this hexagon. So you could just do a pin like a cylinder, you could do a square and a cut through, but I've just done a hexagon here. And the purpose of this is it's an extrude, it's its own little insert. And I've also done an extrude cut in the original main body, which means when we put the two together, that hexagon will align both halves and make sure they're perfectly centered. Now, when you design things like this, there's no clearances between the parts. So if you printed this, it's highly likely it'll be too tight to go together. So I'm gonna go through all my different techniques and then I'll show you how I add clearances back in at the end. So here we have another example. We have this sort of football shaped object. And again, we could just cut it and do an insert, but instead I'm gonna demo another technique you can use to join two parts together after slicing them. And that's to insert a dovetail or like almost like a puzzle piece shaped cut 
that these parts can align into and lock together. So to do that in Fusion 360, you want to become familiar with the surface workspace. So surfaces are zero thickness, which makes them handy for designing shapes that you can punch through and cut things with. So what I have here is this shape. So this is simply a sketch that looks like a dovetail and a dovetail has that really characteristic pattern which sort of cuts in under itself. And then to make this surface, I did an extrude. Now this is a zero thickness extrude. It is not a solid. And we're gonna use this extrude to cut our piece into halves. You don't have to worry too much about how far it goes. You just need to make sure that it extends past the object on all sides. And then we're going, we're going to do the split body tool again. And what we're left with is our original part with that dovetail profile cut right through it. So you can see if I hide one of these here, we've got a dovetail there, and then the top one is here as well. So that's how I add dovetails into prints when I want to print them separately and join them together. It's a really great way to slide something onto a rail, for example, if you want to uh, add it later or change it, maybe have uh, modular parts that you want to slide in. Doing this technique is really good for doing that sort of thing. And for our last slide technique I'm going to show you is using snaps. Now there are many other techniques, I'm sure, very creative ways to join things together, but snaps are something that's used in injection molding and industry all the time, and you can use them too for your 3D printing projects to join things together. I use snaps primarily for my assemblies where I need to put something together and it's like a complicated mechanism and I want to snap together without needing any fasteners. So this is the inside of my rising golden ball mechanism that I showed recently on the channel. And if I hide this piece here and hide the pulley, you can see these little nubs, right? These are simply little revolves that are in the part and the upper part has similar little revolves, but these are a revolve cut. And the way these work, if I just show you a cutaway, is the parts come together, the top part, this blue piece, uh, deforms slightly and then snaps back onto those little uh, little indents and that snaps the two halves together and keeps them in place. Without that they would they would go together but they wouldn't stay together um, and this is a really simple way of snapping two things in place and you can remove them using like a screwdriver to get between the edges and pry it but this is usually used for like a more permanent approach but keep in mind if you want to do snaps you need to allow some room for deformation. You can't have, if this part was solid on top, for example, uh, you can't have snaps because there's no room for the plastic to bend and snap back. It can't deform. So you need to keep that in mind if you're gonna use this approach, but it's a really, really good way to snap pieces together securely. And it's very easy to CAD in. You just do a revolve. And for example, for this piece, it was a revolve that I just patterned four times to get this result. Okay, now we have our rotary techniques. These are things that screw together in some way. And the first obvious example is a screw, a screw thread. So you can design screw threads in Fusion. It even has a built-in feature for it, but I don't use it very often. And I'll try to demonstrate why. But again, here we have that sort of football shape. And this has been designed with a screw thread. So we have two halves that would screw together. So let me show you how we designed it. Again, we're going to use the surface workflow to split the two parts using the split body tool. Uh, but this time, because it's rotary, we're gonna do a revolve using the surface tool. So a surface revolve. So here's our sketch. This is what I've designed. I'm gonna edit the sketch and show you what it looks like. And it has some very specific geometry built into it to keep printability in mind. You're looking back on the dovetail example, only one half of that dovetail would print without supports. The other half would have needed supports. This approach is designed to not need supports at all. And I'll show you why. We have this cut here, and then it goes up here. And then the angle is 45 degrees, which is a very safe overhang angle. And then it goes across on a shelf three millimeters. Now that shelf I'll remove later on with a chamfer to make sure that the top half has no overhangs beyond 45 degrees. We're only using this profile to cut uh, central axis for the revolve is here. So finish sketch and I'll show you the revolve. Here we go. So this is what the revolve looks like. Um, we've got that middle piece coming out up across here and then that's the original shape. And then we're going to do again a split body using that surface revolve, which leaves us with this profile. 
So it looks like a mushroom or something. So we've got this piece and we've got the bottom piece like this. And that leaves us with these two halves that could in theory just go together. But again, they would be able to spin in place. Maybe with some friction, you can force them together, but they're not going to stay together. There's nothing locking them in place. So we're going to use the thread tool to make these two halves screw together. But before we do that, I'm going to change a few things on our geometry. To start with, I did this. This is using the press pull command. I bought, brought the bottom surface of the top part inwards by five millimeters. So why did I do that? Well, you don't need the thread to bottom out. In fact, you don't really want it to. You want it to be tight and use the friction, the friction of the threads to hold the pieces together. But you don't you actually don't want it to be on the bottom of this bore here because there's a chance that there'll be, you know, 3D printing's not accurate completely. It's not a perfect process. There's a chance that you'll actually end up with a gap of the two parts fitting together. So I just added that gap of five millimeters and then I did this, which is adding that chamfer in, like I mentioned. So you imagine this part, this top half, now it would print without support material before it would have needed support material for that shelf, but now it doesn't. Uh, and our bottom piece, if we view it as if it was going to be printed, yeah, look, there's not much surface area for that bottom part, but that's why I had that three millimeter uh, part going out. Otherwise, it would be a sharp angle touching the bed. We all know that that's not going to hold onto the bed. It's not going to stay adhered. So this is a thin uh, surface area to hold down, but at least you could add a brim or something to keep it in place. And these two parts would print without supports. So let's add our threads in, shall we? Starting with the bottom half. So you go to create and thread. And then you drop it in on a face, which is this one here. And it's very important to tick modeled. Otherwise they're just aesthetic. They don't, they're not actually part of the geometry. They just look like there's threads on, which is normally how people would design stuff in CAD because you don't usually like machine threads directly from the geometry in the CAD program you usually like machine them later using a tap or something. But because we're 3D printing, we can actually put them into the file and the geometry itself. So we're gonna model them in. Uh, and it's very important to choose a size that you can use on both sides. Now it's going to try to adjust to one that works for you and it's auto chosen 40 millimeters here. So size is 40 and designation is 40 by three. So the pitch is three, it goes up three millimeters each rotation. And you can change that to a finer pitch, for example, two millimeters but Corsa is better when it comes to 3D printed threads. So I'm gonna keep it at 40 times three and direction you can, if you want a left hand thread, absolutely just make sure you make both left hand. I'm gonna leave this like this and then, okay. So we have a fully modeled thread and I've actually gone ahead and done the same for the top half as well with a different feature. You can't do two at once, uh, two different bodies, but it's the same size. You're gonna make sure you choose the same size thread. Otherwise, obviously they're not gonna thread together, are they? Uh, so we've done that and something you'll notice straight away with the uh, cut through analysis tool is they don't line up uh, You can see here the threads. It looks like it's not gonna work Don't worry about that. It just determines where they've started and finished The only time you should care about this is if there's details on the surface of the parts that need to align and in which case I do not recommend using threads because they will tighten up to a certain point of friction and you can't predict exactly where that will be so only use Printed threads, uh, coarse ones, when you can screw something together, it doesn't really matter where the two parts end up in relation to each other. But there you go, you can do threads like that. But a technique I much prefer is to do a sweep and revolve that sweep to create a thread-like geometry that's actually much easier to 3D print. So I'm gonna show you that. So here we have a cube. Now, normally a cube would be easy to 3D print, but just for sake of demonstration, what I've done is I have cut this cube using the sweep tool. Again, CAD for newbies, I've shown sweeping before, and you can actually add a twist angle to that sweep. The cool thing about this model though, is we're using a surface to do our sweep. So here, I've got a profile at the bottom, which is literally just a spline. I've just gone blah, 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 to make sort of a dovetailish spline on a sketch. And then I've swept that spline up a Another sketch, just a line up the middle, and I've rotated that sweep with a twist angle of 180 degrees. So that means it's gone full 180 from the bottom to the top, and it's resulted in it ending up at 180 degrees 
on the top of the corner of the cube itself. So you can see it's lining up there nicely because I made sure my sweep path or rail, depending on what CAD program you're coming from, is aligned straight from the bottom to the top of the cube as well. That's important. If you're using the twist angle, it's along the whole length of your path. So make sure the path's the right length. So that's pretty cool. And we've got this really neat looking sweep and we're going to use that sweep to do a split body. And the resulting shape is amazing. Um, I love doing this sort of thing. Look how gorgeous that is. So these two parts will slide together. Top to bottom, they'll slide together and end up with a solid object. It's really elegant. They'll snap together, although they'll probably, they can still keep sliding if you don't add anything to stop that, um, but they won't pull apart as such. So this is a great way to add things together and Devin over at Make Anything used this twist technique to do his twisty vases where like these little uh, and fidget spinners and stuff where you had like a really interesting outside profile and parts that went together in and out. Looks really cool, go check them out. He did a whole video series on them. And I actually used that technique to do a puzzle back in 2018. This is my puzzle cube and you can see all of these parts have been cut using a sweep. And they look like they shouldn't go together, which is really cool. Like they look really strange, um, but they do. They do completely go together. And that video is here if you're interested. And that file is up for free on my uh, Podia store. And it's, really, it's a really fun puzzle. It's actually harder than you might think. So to recap, you can sweep a surface and actually add a twist to that sweep if you like to make parts rotate as they index together to join into a final model. Okay, now it's time for, in my opinion, the king of rotary joining methods. Um, this is something I use a lot on my more recent models. It's a more challenging approach to modeling a joining technique, but it's by far the most satisfying. So here I have a rod and here I have a cap and the rod has nubs on it. And the cap has grooves that match those nubs. And what happens is you put it in and then you rotate around and then it's permanently locked in place. Really, really satisfying. I used it on my, my rising golden ball 3D model and I'm using it in this new model that I'm gonna release soon. So I've rolled everything back to the beginning and let me show you how I designed these parts. And I'm gonna start with this sketch. Now this sketch is used to define the nub on the part that's inserted and rotated and locked into place, but also the path that it follows on the other part. So I use the same sketch for both and that's important. Uh, because it's easier <laughs> and it means if you change this size, it'll update both parts. So with this sketch, I created the first uh, revolve cut and this revolve cut was done using the central, central axis of this cylinder as the rotating uh, axis. So it rotated around and it's important because you can determine how far it rotates using an angle. I think this is 80 degrees. Um, it doesn't matter, you can choose your own angle to line up with something, which is why it's good to use this technique to index things accurately if you need to line up versus a thread, which is really difficult to perfectly line up things because it just it's when the friction bites in versus this, which is when it runs out of path, which is my preferred method. And then from here, I did the nub. So you can see here with a central rod, I've got a, another revolve. This is a revolve uh, join, it's, it's adding material and it's just using the axis and the center of the circle to add a sphere onto that rod. The next step is to allow for that actual rod to go in and then rotate and stamp into place. So you need to add a path for it to actually go through. So again, I use the same sketch, which is why it's got this big uh, rectangle attached. I use that profile to cut this detail here, which means as you can see down here, that that little nub will come down and then rotate around the part and then lock into place. And then as a final touch, and this is optional, um, I actually added another sketch, which is on this face here, right at the end of the path. And I just revolved that to make a nice rounded cut. So the actual nub can go all the way to the end. This is a little bit pedantic. You don't have to do it, but it means it will rotate the full 80 degrees versus a little bit less because it would hit that hard edge. Now for most people, this is probably totally fine. We can do a rotary pattern and we're good to go. But what I found with this piece originally, so I can show you here, is I was tr had trouble getting the friction to hold it in place. You can see it's very easy to just go in and come out. So I wanted to add another little nub in place that it sort of pushes over and jams into place, which is what this little detail is here. 
Uh, getting these the right size is challenging. This little nub here, it needs to be small enough that it can just be kind of mushed out of the way because there's no room for deformation, but big enough that it actually locks it in place. We're just adding something that will just kind of be a sacrificial bit of uh, a catch, kind of. So when it pushes past that, it's very unlikely to ever come back out. And once you're happy with that, you can just do a rotary pattern to copy all of those features around so you have a good uniform distribution of points where you can insert the part and rotate it and lock it in place. And luckily Fusion does rotary patterns with features quite reliably actually, it's quite good. So I've got adjust here which seems to work quite well as the compute option. And I've done three, three points. And you can see here, now we have three points of entry. So we'll have three little nubs that go in and rotate around to lock into place just like that. Okay, so let's address the elephant in the room. These parts have no clearances, none at all, which means if you try to print them like this, they're likely to be too tight. Now, sometimes you want them to be tight. You want a friction fit. And when it comes to parts like this, you might get away with zero clearance. However, that is very dependent on your printer's accuracy and quality and what type of geometry you're going for. So how I add clearances into my models these days, it's incredibly simple. Let me just show you. It's using the press pull command. This is by far, I've found the easiest way to add clearances and modify them should you need to. So you select the object you want to add a clearance to. So this is all little nubs and the rod itself. So all you need to do is now add in the clearance that you want and we need to offset the surfaces inwards in this case. So we're gonna add a negative 0.1 millimeters. Uh, this is gonna be a tight part. I want it to be tight. If you want lots of clearance and you want the parts to be really free, you might do a 0.2 or 0.3 even, uh, or offset both by 0.2 so you end up with a 0.4 gap overall. Up to you, really it's up to you how you find uh, what works best for you. So I'll say okay with that. So you can see here, we've got a nice clearance of 0.1 millimeters, which means the parts will not be too tight and you can adjust that easily. And it's probably the, the best way I've found in Fusion to add clearances to your models for 3D printing. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something new about creating parts that are in pieces in Fusion 360 and joining them together later for whatever purpose it might be, whether to make it easier to print or to fit your print volume or for aesthetic purposes or to assemble a complicated piece later on. I'm gonna leave you here with this picture, this cutaway of a model I'm working on. It's for Easter. This has been one of, by far, one of the most complicated models I've ever worked on to get right and it's got all the tips I mentioned, it's got the screw threads joined together, it's got a rotary sweep, it's got offsets, it's crazy stuff. So I look forward to showing this later in, uh, in on the channel. And if you want to see more future content like this, please let me know in the comments that you enjoyed it and you want to see more. And also maybe consider subscribing so you don't miss it. Thanks for watching guys. Bye.